girls to stand as able for the family to enter. Friends, we gather this morning in this space made holy by the assurance of God in our need. We come in sorrow because of the loss of a woman uh, so greatly loved by those here gathered. And we come also in joy for a life well lived and joy for the assurance that Marion Edith Noseworthy Bedell has been received into her heavenly home and into a life everlasting, where there is no more pain or tiredness or tears. As a community of faith, we extend our condolences to the family. And as a community, 
we promise to, to sit on the morning bench with you, to surround you with our prayers, and to make this safe, this place a safe space for, for you to share your, your tears and your happy memories. Hear these words from scripture that they may bring comfort to you. A selection of verses from the Gospel of John. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall never perish, but have eternal life. And from the 11th chapter of John, verse 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, though they die, will live. And from John 14, Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, because in my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you will be also. Let us pray. Merciful God, who hears the deepest sighs of our soul, we know that you are with this family this morning as they say goodbye to their mother and grandmother and friend. The price of loving someone dearly is often grief at their passing. And we thank you that such great love is displayed here this day. As we remember this woman, may all we do and say be to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We begin our service this morning by proclaiming our faith in song. Marion had a list of songs that... Uh, that she loved and the family chose uh, some for us to share together this morning. So we're gonna sing Abide With Me.
we have a, a number of folks who this morning want to share memories that they have of Marion. Um, the first group is going to be from uh, sh Memories of Mom. I invite John to come up. I was really hoping that song wouldn't end quite so quickly. Um, before I do anything else, um, I, I need to do the, uh, the thank yous. Um, my sisters and I have been in agreement for some days that so far we do not like being orphans. Um, but um, all the cards and calls and, and visits and tributes and memories um, don't make it easier, but they make it possible for us to get through this. <coughs> so thank you. Um, <coughs> thanks to everybody for the support. Um, thank you all who, uh, who came today. I realize that this is kind of a an odd time to be gathering, um, but thank you for coming out and, and supporting us. Um, and thank you to everybody who contributed in any way to today's service. Um, uh, of course, thanks to Reverend Cheryl and, and also my friends here at, at St. John Stevensville. Um, and finally, uh, a word of thanks to the, the staff at Willoughby Manor um, who took such good care of mom and dad <coughs> for so many years um, with such caring and compassion. We, we the family, relied on that. Um, so much and hope hope they know how much we appreciate that um, Before I actually get to the the tribute part of this um, I want to explain one of the pictures that you might have seen flipping by on the uh, on the slideshow before Several people will probably mention the term under one roof. It's a it's a it's a family thing um, This is a silly picture that this is our family um, code for under one roof um, and the reason I mention that is because that was one of mom's favorite things, her kids and her being under one roof. Um, and and <clears throat> that's why she waited um, until all three of her kids were there on December 26th to let go. <coughs> she wanted us under one roof. So, to this day, um, me and my, my siblings um, remain blessed by the fact that we enjoy being together under one roof. Oh, and, and to be honest, that's how we've gotten through all of this. Um, there's been some inappropriate humor, but um, all of us together have, have made this possible. So, to, uh, to honor Mom, um, I just told a couple of stories. Um, there are so many, um, but anyway. Mom and Dad both had a, a similar approach to teaching me and my sisters um, the things that they felt were important for us to know. Um, and it wasn't so much the words, it was the actions. We were expected to learn by watching them do every day what they felt was right to do. Um, Mom's early years were, were challenging in ways that, that we can't even understand. Um, and she never really talked about how hard that had been. But it's obviously why she felt it was, it was so important to provide a hand up to people experiencing times of need. Um, many, many years ago when I started doing their income tax for them, I, I still remember how dumbfounded I was at the list of agencies that they supported over the years. Um, so my first story is from many, many years ago um, when mom was the church secretary at Kitchener Street United Church. Um, as secretary, she had um, access to a, a certain amount of benevolent money that, um, and, and because the, the church office was right beside the back door of the, the church, um, it was her responsibility to, to dole out those, those funds um, when people came asking for, for help. Um, she used to talk about the, uh, the young indigenous men um, who would come by when, when they were in need. Um, there, for, for, um, for people like that, they're, they're sort of a, a network and, and they know where they can get help and they knew that mom was there. Um, she always talked about how polite they were and how thankful they were for, for whatever she could give them. Um, and I know for a fact that when the kitty ran dry in the, the benevolent funds, there were times she would dip into her, <coughs> her own purse. Um, I know Dad and, and the rest of us were occasionally concerned about her safety with some of the, uh, the rough characters that, that came in, but she was absolutely unwavering in wanting to do that, uh, what she felt was right. 
Um, and I know of at least one of the young men that, that she helped over the years who actually came back later to thank her and to explain how well he was doing now. So what, what makes that story particularly poignant for me uh, today is, is we know now, we know some of the, uh, the cultural tra trauma that some of those young men had suffered. Um, at that time, none of us knew that. She did not know that. All she knew was that they needed her help, and, and that was all she needed to know. Second story um, I want to tell you is similar in a way. Um, quite a few years later, uh, Dad was headed out one morning to, uh, to work on the motorhome in the driveway. Um, and as he was unlocking the door of the motorhome, there, a voice called out from, from inside the motorhome saying, don't freak out, man, I'm in here. And, and so it turns out a, a homeless man had crawled in through a window that had been left ajar on the motorhome and spent the night in, in the motorhome in, a, in shelter. So um, Dad, of course, was, was not particularly pleased with that. Um, and he was ready to run the, the guy off the property. Um, but Mom wouldn't let him run the guy off the property until she made him a sandwich so he had something to eat. Um, <coughs> and then as, as the, the, uh, the guy was headed down the street leaving, um, Mom chased him down to give him a couple of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, contribute to his next meal. I, I love that story. <laughs> um, we, we laugh about it, but how many people are there under those circumstances who would go to their way to, uh, to provide help to somebody who broken into part of their property? Um, but I know of at least one who would. So that's, that's the... Uh, barely getting through this, but that's the end of my stories for today. Uh, you'll hear some recurring themes in there, but those were the examples I have of, uh, that tell a little bit about Mom's character, and, and that was kind of what I wanted to celebrate today. Here are some thoughts from my sister Kathy about and for our mom. So many things my mother said to me in the past few years of her life are locked away in my mind and heart forever as treasure. Some are little things, her smiling, hi love, you're my tweets. Oh no, your paddy whackers are cold. Come sit on my lap. I'm so glad you have pretty blue eyes like your daddy-o. I'm feasting my eyes on you and there's a tear in my eye like a traveling rat. I really don't mind the grief. I don't mind missing mom and dad. I can take the sudden jabs or the deep heartaches, the unexpected nudge of memory because I'm strong like they made me. The pain is beautiful and rich in its way. I guess it is a gift to miss her because that means I had her. We spent so much time together, simple, peaceful hours. We sat quietly, chatted a little, read old letters or poetry by Robert Frost or Mary Oliver, laughed our heads off, looked through old photo albums, talked about dad or grandma or baby McKee. We held hands a lot. She loved multiple kisses and would always count them with delight. 24, I must be pretty special. She didn't say much in her final days. I was happy to know she wore the comfy new nightie that she pronounced pretty and soft that I gave her for Christmas on her last night. One of the last things she said was, I love you too, to my Hillary. My mom gave me the book, The Prophet, many years ago, a book she loved. She loved the words, and when the earth shall claim your limbs, then shall you truly dance. No more walker, no more pain, no more loneliness, mom. Rest well, and thank you for waiting for all of us to say goodbye. My mother was my touchstone, a reminder that quiet gentleness is powerful. I will miss her forever and will be for grateful for the missing. Thanks, Kath. Sorry, this is from me, <laughs> the other daughter. Um, we're here to celebrate my mom's life and what a great life it was. She grew up without much, but her mom, my wonderful grandma Hartley, taught her that you can be happy with what you have. They had a lifelong relationship of mutual love and support and also a lot of fun. Then there's mom and dad. They were one of those wonderful couples who built a life together and had an exemplary lifelong relationship. The other night, my kids were looking through the photos I was organizing to display here. 
They were commenting on how happy Grandma and Grandpa always were and how inviting and welcoming their home on Rosedale, the homestead, was. How lucky am I to have grown up there with two wonderful parents and a happy home. Mom was a teacher and she used those skills to be a great mom too. She was practical and organized but also creative and whimsical. I remember one time when she was sick and on bed rest and we were little and she had us all in there working on a big drawing together. I remember it as being fun and she must have had a lot of patience. She didn't like it when other parents said they couldn't wait until their kids were back at school or they were dreading summer holidays because she was the opposite. She was glad when we were one home. She always liked it best when we were all under one roof at every stage of life. Mom did the budget for the family. She had a binder with envelopes attached. She always made sure we had everything we needed. Great Christmases, birthdays, and at least one vacation every year, usually camping and sometimes a road trip as well. Um, Mom was very involved in home and school and the church. She set a great example and she would do anything for our family, sometimes by necessity. Like when we were growing up and getting busier, she reluctantly learned to drive, something she never really enjoyed, but she did it for us and to help Dad. My cousin John even got wind of it. He was serving in Vietnam and he kept in touch with us through letters. He wrote, it was quite a shock to hear that you were driving, Aunt Marion. Am I safe over here? After all, there's only one ocean between us. And then he went on to say he was kidding. <laughs> um, my mom didn't like to inconvenience anyone. So when it came to four-way stops, she'd try to let everybody go first. We, we had a hard time convincing her that she wasn't really helping anyone, <laughs> but she was trying to be polite and she always got us home safely. Maybe that's the reason um, Rock Point became their favorite camping destination. Um, Dad couldn't convince Mom to drive much further <laughs> in their little car following their big motor home. But whatever the reason, we will cherish many wonderful memories of family camping trips there. Mom got a job as a secretary at our church, which was a great fit as it was her, her and our second home. But there was a learning curve. There was an evil device called a Gestetner machine that was used to print the church calendars. It was so stressful to use that Mum nicknamed printing day, Terror Day. I think it was Thursdays. I remember going with her if I was off school to provide emotional support. She always did a great job though. Mum liked finishing things off well. It showed in everything she did, like the finishing touches on her birthday cakes and her Christmas decorating and her cookies. She told me she spelled my name with an E on the end of it because it always looked more finish off, finished off. Mom's last words to me were, I love you and thanks, honey. Mom, I love you too and you're welcome. Thank you for waiting for me that last day. Being able to comfort you along with my sister and brother was a gift I will cherish forever. And Lastly, everyone was welcomed at my parents' house. Mom and Dad always waved goodbye to finish off the visit. When they moved to Willoughby, they would walk you out to the front porch and wave from there. After Dad was gone, Mom was less mobile. She would wave from her window. It always ended the visit with one last connection and a smile from both sides. Please join me in waving goodbye to my wonderful Mom. Bye, Mom. Love you. Well, I'm referred to as one of the three outlaws to my mother-in-law, Marion. I've been married to her son, John, for 36 years. It's hard no, to know where to start because I have many memories and stories of knowing mom for 40 years, of her 87 years of life. So I'll just share a few today. We never had an argument. She was easygoing, kind, faithful, and loving. She was an amazing pie maker in her day, making many for church bazaars, church dinners, and all of our family dinners. She always made many kinds, so everybody got their favorite. Her most famous pie of all was her apple pie. No apple pie could compare, according to Dad and John. I accepted that challenge and got close, but not quite. 
I could never roll the pastry as thin as Mum could. Christmas was a very special time at the homestead. With mountains of gifts, it took most of the afternoon to open, starting with the youngest to the oldest. Whoever got a sweater got put it on and got a big hug, and whoever got new pants got bum pinches. <laughs> Fond memories I hold dear. Mom always invited her single friend Joyce to Christmas dinner and festivities as part of our family. She always bought her a small gift for her to open to. As the family grew, so did the Christmas table, which eventually extended into the living room for her six grandchildren to sit around. Mom and Dad enjoyed their grandchildren immensely. Mom always gave me a new cookbook for Christmas. I have quite the collection. I guess it was to make sure that her son was well fed. She always signed them love, with love, Mom and Dad. We always had family yard sales in the summer. Mostly we'd swap things between each other and then had fun selling the rest. Mom always helped at rummage sales at Kitchener Street Church and had many lifelong friends from doing so. Some of them formed a Scrabble group and would go in between each other's homes to play. She could still play a good game of Scrabble even though we always knew who the winner would be, John. <laughs> we had many family camping trips at Rock Point Provincial Park. And one year we had a torrential rainstorm during the night and Carol's tent collapsed in. We never gave in and went home. Luckily, Mom and Dad had their motor home at that time, so they were protected. Mom and Dad also loved taking photos. Many family memories put into 100 photo albums. We're currently having them digitalized so we can all keep the memories alive. We had many Fridays at Willoughby Manor happy hours. Mom would always order ginger ale or Coke and she enjoyed tapping her toes to the music. We missed going when the pandemic hit and Willoughby Manor was closed to visitors. By the time we were allowed back in for visits, Mom's health was slowly declining. We were thankful for the time that we did get to spend with her. John and I were holding her hand the day she passed and she gave us a little hand squeeze and we looked at each other and smiled. She knew we were there. That will always be with me until we meet again. Signing out as one of the outlaws, you can now rest in peace with your beloved. Love you. I am going to read Glenn's memories. I first met mom and dad about 14 years ago. It didn't take me long to move from Mr. and Mrs. Bedell to mom and dad. They made me feel like part of the family immediately. I found mom to be a very bright and caring, humorous lady and a loving mother to us all. It was always an honor and a privilege to be a friend, caregiver, and loving son-in-law to her. I loved this dear, sweet lady as if she were my own mom, who I lost long ago. Recently, mom told Kathy that she was so happy that she had finally found her Dino. She told her that she should call me Gino, because there could only be one Dino. When I heard about this conversation, it meant the world to me. She loved me as her own. What more could a son-in-law ask? I'm so grateful to have known her.
I invite you once again to um, ex express your faith as we sing together, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, as you probably gathered, she had a pretty big impact on all of our lives. Uh, I just wanted to share a couple memories. Um, I always remember Grandma's love of all our critters, big and small. She always loved the family pets, but I remember from being a little kid feeding the chipmunks on her back porch. Little tiny chipmunks crawl out of her garden. She always had a peanut ready for them. I mean, I was just a little guy back then, but I always stuck with me. And always when we were camping, too, she'd always be eager to point out any of the creatures we saw. And the other thing, of course, as has been mentioned, she loved being in the kitchen. She was a great baker. And she always was happy to show us anything we wanted to know and definitely instill the love of the kitchen in me. I remember cooking the stew that I really liked, and she would show me how to make it. And that's still something I make today. I remember, too, of course, our camping trips. Those were not just for her children. We continued with the grandkids. We'd always wait to see the motorhome coming down the road. You know we'd be going camping. I always remember the rainy days camping. We'd spend inside the motorhome playing board games with her. And again, she was so generous. If you ever needed help, she'd be there. Everybody. My name is Christine and I am the oldest daughter of Carol and Steve and the second oldest grandchild of Marion Bedell. My speech represents the grandchildren from London, Ontario, so that includes my sisters Alex and Jenny. We grew up with the experience of living away from our grandparents, so that meant awesomely fun visits on the weekend. We got to pack and drive a while to a different city to sleep over at our grandparents for a whole weekend. These visits were so special because we didn't get to see them all that often, and any visits we got with our cousins was amazing too. I'll keep our basement shenanigans out of this speech. Anyways, Grandma and Grandpa would always greet us with huge smiles and loving hugs. 
Grandma would always provide us with the most tasty food, as was mentioned in a previous speech. It was so tasty that I would fight my Uncle John for the last slice of apple pie. Each visit guaranteed good food and good company. My grandparents were the sweetest souls. You can bet that their kindness, hospitality, and their ability to love endlessly to each other and the people around them will transcend through time. We, their grandchildren, and our parents, their kids, are their legacy. We couldn't have asked for better teachers in capturing adventure, valuing family and friends, and just getting her done no matter what. The way we carry ourselves and the choices we make reflect back on the love that Don and Marion gave us. I am so grateful that we could all be under one roof today to honor the life of my sweet, sweet grandma. She knew how to be cute 24 seven. Grandma was cute in her aprons while she cooked in her kitchen. Her cuteness filled the room with her smile and her laughter. She was even cute while giving her pouty face when she didn't want to get her nails trimmed. Her iconic attributes like cheek pinches and witty sayings will live on through all of us. I know she will always be present somehow because the ones that love us never really leave us and they can be found right here in our hearts. So as grandma used to say to me during our phone calls while I lived in England, you behave yourself now, don't you be getting into trouble? <clears throat> and I would reply, I'll try my best. Then we would both chuckle. <clears throat> so let's all try our best to stay out of trouble now. Love you forever, grandma. Good morning. Among the things I'm most grateful for, I count my 30 years with my grandmother twice. As you may know, my grandmother was the perfect combination of love, laughter, and light. There are countless beautiful memories and ways to honor her, and for that I will always be grateful. One of my favorite conversations ever with my grandmother was years ago, but upon her passing last month, I reflected upon it many times. I was between shifts and walking around Lakefield. She was at home when I called her and she inquired about what Lakefield looked like now, as she was from the Peterborough area many moons ago. What do you see, she said, and I always thought that was just the cutest question. And I described the scenery, the locks, the boats, etc. But that what do you see phrase crossed my mind many times as I looked at her aging hands, her aged little face, and her tiny tapping toes. Because even despite many illnesses and hardships, she was always smiling, quick-witted, and kind. So what did she see? She spent 62 years married to my grandfather who adored her and cherished her until the very end. She saw three wonderful children grow up. She saw six grandchildren grow and find their joy. She saw a great-grandson whose tiny hands fit just perfectly in hers somehow. She saw marriages, engagements, dozens of camping trips, and countless memories and family celebrations. She saw holiday decorations filled with years worth of memories and carefully placed around her home. My grandmother and I both started our teaching journey in Peterborough. She attended normal school, as it was called then, just around the corner from where I lived there. She always joked that though she attended normal school, clearly it didn't work for her. I loved sharing my teaching journey with her. When I did a placement teaching English at a federal penitentiary, my grandmother loved listening to my stories and shared my empathetic heart for people with circumstances much different from our own. That's who she was. She could find light in dark places in difficult times. She was careful to never be judgmental, and I always admired that and eventually worked it into my own pedagogy. But I know what she saw every day, too. She saw the best in everyone. She found love in every corner of the world from big creatures to small. She found laughter and light, she counted forehead kisses, made the same noise every time she was squeezed really tight, and she was sassy and hilarious until the very end. One of her best lines came a few years ago when she asked me how long was left until dinner. When I responded, she snapped back with, oh good, I need time to put my tiara on. My grandma saw pure love, and now I hope she's seeing my grandfather, her Dino, which is definitely the same thing. I am forever grateful that my grandfather is with her now, and I can picture him in some faraway land popping up from under someone's old rusty car to welcome her with open arms. I'll miss you, Grandma. Your legacy lives on in the compassion of others. I promise I will always try to see the world as you did.
This morning's first piece of scripture is, um, is a familiar psalm. And I'd like to remind people that the psalms were written as both prayers and as hymns. And often the psalms would have been sung as part of worship. Um, quite some time ago now, in the 1600s, uh, there was a Scottish Psalter put together where a number of the psalms were put to the music uh, that is comfortable to Western ears. And so this morning, I've been asked to share with you the 23rd Psalm. And I would encourage you, as you hear these words, as you hear these words, hear them as directed at you. Because at this moment, it is you who are walking through the valley of death. And so the words of the 23rd Psalm to the tune of Crimmond. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie. In pastures green, he leadeth me. The quiet waters by my soul he doth restore again, and me to walk doth make within the paths of righteousness, even for his own namesake. Yea, though I walk in death's dark veil, yet will I fear no ill, for thou art with me and thy rod and staff me come forward still. My table thou hast furnished in presence of my foes. My head thou dost with oil anoint, and my cup overflows. Goodness and mercy all my life shall surely follow me and in god's house forevermore my dwelling place shall be A reading from Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And another one of the Psalms, Psalm 62. Truly my soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken.
my soul finds rest in God alone. That line from Psalm 62 is a powerful statement of faith and true of a woman whom her children told me, a woman whose faith was rock solid throughout her life and was rock solid in her passing. The reading from Romans 8 was the same passage read at Marion's husband's funeral, whom she lovingly referred to as Dino. Romans itself is a, is a dense book with many uh, theological truths from which we glean our doctrine, not our doctrinal understandings as a Chris, Christian church. <clears throat> and in many ways, the Apostle Paul is, is using his letter to the church in Rome to launch the church into this Gentile stronghold and proclaim God's goodness and mercy as being at the very core of the gospel that he is preaching. And Paul offers an assurance of salvation to the community by arguing that because we belong to God as God's children, we, we trust ourselves to God's uh, providential care. We know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Sometimes, you know, we don't understand why life unfolds the way it does. But we are assured, according to the Apostle Paul, that God is with us during those, those moments. And the Gospel of Jesus Christ is the story of God's love. It is the story into which we, each and every one of us, are written into as daughters and sons of God. And we are told that there is nothing that can then separate us from, from God's love. Paul even offers a, a litany of examples. Neither life nor death, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers nor heights or depth, or anything in all of creation. In a different place in the letter, he would, he would add principalities and powers. But the point is that there is nothing, nothing that will make God ever not love us. And it is that assurance of salvation that makes hard days like today just a little bit easier. Because Marion was a woman that was written in to God's love story as a daughter of the God who created her. A daughter of the God who created the universe. Marion was a woman who loved and was loved. And shared that love through friendships and gratitude. Her daughter told me that even while in, in the last days of her life in care, she never failed to say please and thank you to those who were caring for her, even when it became just a glance or a smile. She loved her children. She loved her grandchildren. She learned that love from her own mother. Marion was in many ways the strength behind her family taught them how to, to laugh and to joke and how to enjoy life. And from the, the stories and the tears that we have heard this morning, we know that she will be missed. I invite you to pray with me. Loving God, parent of us all, today we give thanks for the life of your child, Mary. We thank you for the service that she gave to your church, the service that she gave to her community. And we are especially grateful for the love and the care that she gave to her family. May her good works and compassion be remembered when, when folks speak her name, as her shortcomings 
are quickly forgotten as unimportant. It is our faith, O oh God, that though she has died, she has entered into your glory, into your presence, and lives eternally with you now. And so as a community of faith, we extend our prayers for Marion's children. And we pray your comfort on Kathy and Glenn, on Carol and Steve, on John and Lori. We pray for her grandchildren and her great-grandchild. May they hold on to one another as you hold them close to your heart. God of all consolation, help us to comfort one another in our grief, finding light in time. We pray this all in Jesus' name, as we are bold to pray. Before we sing our last hymn, just uh, a note that because of the, the COVID regulations that we are under right now, that after our hymn, uh, we will have a, the commendation and blessing. And then I'm going to invite you to leave the sanctuary through these doors and out that way rather than going back that way. But I will invite you one more time to uh, express your faith in song. The last hymn is one that uh, Marion also really enjoyed, Will Your Anchor Hold. <laughs>
through this, go further the depth. Acknowledge me humble first, a sheep of your own herd, a lamb of your own flock, a daughter of your own redeemer. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace. Thank you.